בוקר טוב לכולם, אה, תודה שבאתם, זה כיף לראות פה את הפנים המוכרות והפחות מוכרות בנושא שמאוד מאוד קרוב ל- לליבי ואני מניחה שאם אתם פה הוא כנראה גם אה, קרוב אה, ללבכם. אני מצטרפת לברכות ולתודות של משה, אני לא אמנה את כל הרשימה אבל באמת הייתה פה עבודה לאורך כל השנה ואחר כך לקראת ההכנה לכנס יוצאת מן הכלל שאני רוצה להצטרף באמת לתודות האלה בלי העבודה הזאת לא היינו נפגשים פה ולא הייתה חוברת כזאת יפה ולא היו מרצים כל כך מוצלחים שאתם עומדים לשמוע ביומיים הקרובים אני רוצה להזמין תכף את דוקטור אנדי בנט לבמה שהוא כמובן איש מקצוע מהשורה הראשונה וגם קולגה שלי בעבר ב-ETS אז זה ממש כיף לראות אותו פה אני בעברית מכיוון שהוא שומע אותנו באנגלית Do you hear us now? רנדי, can you hear us? לא, כן רוצה נורא בקצרה מכיוון שיש בחוברת אנחנו לא נקרא את כל קורות החיים של כולם לאורך הכנס בשביל זה יש את החוברת המוצלחת הזאת אבל בכל זאת כמה מילים על רנדי הוא מופקד היום על קתדרה לחדשנות בהערכה בשירות הבחינות החינוכי בארצות הברית זה מכון המבחנים הגדול ביותר שנקרא ETS ויושב בפרינסטון הוא כבר מעל שלושים שנה עוסק בנושא של שילוב בתחום של קוגניציה, טכנולוגיה והערכה והשילוב הזה מבשיל היום לתוצאות מאוד מאוד מעניינות. בעבר הוא ניהל פרויקט מאוד מיוחד במסגרת מערכת המשוב האמריקאית שנקראת נייפ, גם הראשונים ששילבו טכנולוגיה באופן מושכל בבחינות בהיקף ארצי רחב כזה והתוצרים מסוכמים בעבודות מחקר שלו ששווה לקרוא אותן ולאחרונה עוסק בין היתר בנושא שהוא יציג לנו אותו פה ושבשם קצר מאוד נקרא סיבול אבל בעצם הוא באמת עוסק ב-cognitively based assessment of for and as learning. רנדי, it's a pleasure to have you here, the floor is yours. אוקיי, thank you מיכל for that lovely introduction, I really do appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be here. My talk is titled Measuring Well and Modeling Good Teaching and Learning Practice, an example from CBOL. This work uh, is done in collaboration with many members of uh, the CBOL team, uh, but particularly with uh, Peter Van Rijn and uh, Paul Dean. I'm going to begin with a walk through uh, some of the theory that underlies CBOL, the theory of action. Uh, a bit of the domain theory and how we try to model good teaching and learning practice. Next I'm going to show an example implementation and to give you a sense of how that theory uh, might play out. Third I'll describe some empirical results relating to the functioning of scenario based test forms and to learning progression recovery and classification uh, consistency. So I'm going to start with uh, theory at a very broad level, uh, theory of how a system of assessment should operate, move downward to domain theory, theory of what to measure, move downward from there into theory about assessment design, then go to a little bit of implementation and then to empirical uh, results. And I'll close with a summary of the main points. So uh, one thing that should be obvious is that I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about theory. And I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about theory because I don't think there is enough thinking about theory in assessment design. I'm not going to say anything really about technology. And I'm not going to say anything about technology because I think many other presentations will. So, uh, Let me start with uh, talking about what CBOL is. CBOL is an acronym for Cognitively Based Assessment of, For, and As Learning. It's a research program that began in 2007 with the goal of advancing the state of the art by creating, testing, and refining a theory-based system model for assessment in the English language arts, mathematics, and science in primary and secondary school. That system model aspires to do three things. First, documents what student, document what students have achieved 
the of learning aspect. Second, help identify how to plan instruction, the for learning component. And last, provide a worthwhile educational experience in and of itself, the as learning portion. The purpose of the system model is to give a context in which to pose fundamental questions and evaluate new approaches to the creation and use of assessment in primary and secondary education. Why focus on a system of assessment as opposed to a single assessment or on assessment as a process? The reasoning is that educational assessment must serve multiple audiences and those audiences have very different needs. For example, policymakers need information about the functioning of institutions and about the overall performance of individuals. Teachers and students, in contrast, primarily need information about what to do next instructionally. Finally, parents need both types of information. As citizens, they need information about system effectiveness, but as parents, they need information about how to help their kids today. It should be obvious that a single assessment cannot serve these multiple purposes optimally because an assessment tuned to one purpose will not necessarily do a very good job at the others. Further, it should be obvious that the components of any such system must reinforce one another. Like it or not, consequential or high stakes summative assessments drive administrator, teacher, and student behavior. So it makes sense to design a summative assessment to encourage the desired teaching and learning behavior, including the appropriate use of classroom formative assessment. And it makes sense to design classroom formative assessment to further elaborate those desired behaviors. For example, through scaffolding, in ways that summative assessment simply cannot because of the time and cost constraints that it must operate under. The blueprint for achieving this system coherence is specified in a theory of action. The theory of action is an idealization of how the system components are to be used and how that use might be expected to lead to positive effects on individuals and institutions. The Seaball theory is summarized in this logic model, which I know is probably impossible to read, but I will walk you through each bit of it. The model is read from left to right. The Seaball components shown on the left, used in the ways described in the tall center column, are postulated to have the intermediate and ultimate effects shown toward the right. The first CBALL component is a set of domain-specific competency models and learning progressions. The intention is that teachers use the competency models and learning progressions to organize and target instruction and to communicate to students about learning goals. Why do we use competency models and learning progressions when we already have curriculum standards? The competency models and learning progressions act as a bridge from curriculum standards and learning sciences research to assessment design, the design of curriculum, and the design of professional development. By including in design learning sciences principles and domain conceptions, as well as curriculum standards, we should be able to increase our chances of having positive impact on classroom practice, which might not occur to the same degree as if we operated from curriculum standards alone. A point I'll address in more detail in a few minutes. The second component, summative assessment, consists of multiple events occurring at different points in the school year that are aggregated for accountability purposes. Multiple events are used because a single event is too limited to represent both the breadth and depth of curriculum standards faithfully. This idea is used in the US by PARC, a consortium of states that has divided its accountability assessment into two parts, one administered after 75% of the school year has elapsed and the other after 90% of the school year has been completed. Earlier time points are used first for diagnostic, 
and then for interim assessment purposes. The more time points, the more timely and locally useful assessment information can be. But the more intertwined with and constraining of local curricula it becomes. As I noted, different purposes are best served by different instruments. The CBOL summative component is intended to be used by local and state administrators in their decision making related to school improvement and by teachers and students as a starting point for formative follow-up as well as a mechanism for documenting progress. The third CBOL component consists of formative assessment practices and tools that may include elements like discrete item sets, where each set is targeted at a single skill, scenario-based classroom tasks focusing on the integration of multiple skills, extended activities like games and collaborative projects which come closer to the actual performances that we wish students to master, and handbooks that describe some of the ways in which a teacher might integrate the practices and tools with curricula. A teacher might, for example, assign CBOL tasks to individuals as practice exercises, or that teacher might have a discussion with the whole class around how to solve a particular CBOL problem, gathering evidence of what students understand through that classroom discussion and making decisions about next instructional steps based on that evidence. Regardless of the chosen approach, the intention is that teachers and students use the formative component to frequently gather information about students standing on the competency model and learning progressions, and then adjust instruction or learning as appropriate. For CBOL then, formative assessment is a purposeful integration of process and domain-based instrumentation in which teachers and students use evidence to make inferences and based on those inferences take actions intended to achieve learning goals. That conceptualization contains several ideas that are worth emphasizing and I think that are different from many common, many current conceptualizations of formative assessment. First, we see formative assessment not as a process, as many current definitions would assert, but rather as an integration of process and instrumentation. In our view, formative assessment requires situations, activities, tasks, or questions that are specifically designed to elicit evidence for making inferences about what students know and can do with respect to target competencies as well as for helping students develop ownership of their learning processes. That instrumentation might be designed by a skilled teacher, might come from CBOL, or it might come from external sources. Regardless of from where it comes, that instrumentation must be fit for use if it's to provide informa information of value and have impact on learning. A second key idea is that of domain dependency. Process requires content on which to operate. And current process definitions of formative assessment give far too little attention to content. Formative assessment is in fact highly domain dependent, meaning that the nature of formative assessment changes significantly from one domain to the next. What to ask of students what to infer from their responses, how to use those inferences to adapt instruction, and how to model the habits of mind characteristic of proficient domain performance differ dramatically from the English language arts to the mathematics to the sciences to history. The high level characteristics, the use of learning goals, questioning, and feedback may be the same. But the potential power of formative assessment, and indeed the challenge for most teachers is not in those high level characteristics, it's in the domain based details. A third key idea which current process definitions don't make explicit is the fact that formative assessment is an inferential activity. We cannot see inside a student's head. 
We can only make inferences from the behavior that we observe. Formative assessment requires us to inferentially connect our observations of performance to characterizations about what students know and can do so that learning and instruction can be adjusted. As such, formative assessment involves the making of what I'll call formative hypotheses. Hypotheses that are subject to both uncertainty and to unintentional bias on the part of the observer. Factors that teachers as observers must account for if their actions are to be both fair and effective. A final key idea is that current definitions encourage a view of formative assessment as simply an aspect of good teaching. In other words, as a component of pedagogical knowledge. Effective formative assessment does, in fact, require pedagogical knowledge. But as I suggested, it also demands deep knowledge of the domain, including content knowledge for teaching, and also an understanding of measurement principles. An unfortunate fact of life is that the average teacher, at least in the US, is very unlikely to have sufficient command of all three competencies, making the professional development, not to mention the pre-service teacher preparation, challenges enormous. To me, ignoring critical needs for upgrading the teaching forces, content knowledge for teaching, and measurement knowledge by focusing attention on formative assessment as a generic process is a recipe for continued system failure. As a result, in CBALL, we conceptualize and instantiate formative assessment within the context of specific domains. We create a standards-aligned competency model to guide the substance of formative assessment and learning progressions to indicate steps toward mastery of the competencies in that model. We design situations, activities, tasks, and questions to provide evidence of students standing on the competency model and learning progressions and create a process suited to the domain. We use these formative tools and practices in concert with this last CBALL component, professional support, to help teachers bootstrap development of their content knowledge for teaching, their pedagogical knowledge, and their measurement understanding, as well as to help them understand the basics of CBALL implementation. A central action mechanism for this component is for teachers to meet in communities of practice, to share student work and reflect upon their experiences with the competency model, the learning progressions, the formative materials, and summative assessments. The use of the four components in the way I just described is theorized to cause a set of intermediate effects, including greater instructional focus on integrated performances and on higher order skills. In keeping with the emphasis of the competency models, the learning progressions, and the assessment tasks, and also improved student engagement in learning and assessment. These intermediate effects are in turn theorized to contribute to achieving the ultimate effects of more meaningful information for policymakers and improved student learning. The theory of action I just described is a theory for the functioning and design of an assessment system. Any given assessment in this system must also have an underlying domain theory which, as I mentioned, we term a competency model. We've developed such models for the English language arts, mathematics, and middle school science. To get a concrete sense of what a competency model is, let's take a look at the one for the English language arts. For this domain, the competency model takes the form of a set of key practices. A key practice is a bundle of closely related tasks and social interactions that work in synchrony, that call upon a common set of reading, writing, and critical thinking skills, and that are on, that are on the path to achieving college and career readiness. The Seaball English Language Arts Competency Model includes 11 key practices which cross-cut traditional categories like reading and writing, 
From the teacher's point of view, this organization is very important because it focuses on activities designed to achieve socially valued goals rather than on the development of abstract skills in isolation. The key practices are organized developmentally to span kindergarten through post-secondary education. They start with the fundamental literacy practices of speaking, listening, reading, and writing. This group is followed by a model building category, which includes competencies associated with narrative reading and writing on the left, informational reading and writing to the right, and document production on the bottom. Finally, the application category covers such common uses of literacy competencies as in the top row, the interpretational aspects of literary analysis, here called build and justify interpretations, argumentation, called discuss and debate ideas, and research and inquiry at bottom center. Let's take a closer look at one of these key practices, discuss and debate ideas, or argumentation, which gets significant attention in the US Common Core state standards. We conceptualize this practice as a set of phases that might initially be taught in sequence, but that become more iterative and interlocking as competency develops. We begin by having students focus on understanding the stakes, an appeal building phase aimed at helping them construct an argument that's attractive to their audience. Students ask themselves, what do people who are interested in this issue care about? Whose opinions about this issue matter? Whom am I trying to convince and how will I convince them? Whom are others trying to convince and how might they convince them? Next comes exploring the subject, essentially an inquiry phase. What do I know about the subject? What don't I know? How can I find out more and what information is relevant? Third is considering positions, a phase centered around a stance. Students ask, what positions are reasonable? Are they clear and defensible? What position should I take and how should I focus and limit my position? The fourth phase is creating and evaluating arguments which deals with reasons and evidence. What reasons can I use to support my conclusions? Do I have enough evidence to support each reason? And what counter arguments do I need to anticipate? Last comes organizing and presenting arguments where students frame their case. How should I present my argument? What structure is most effective and logical? And how will people with different perspectives present their arguments? As you can see, each phase involves one or more competencies. For each of those competencies, there's a learning progression to suggest how that competency might develop. How are the key practices used in the design of CBOL assessments? CBOL summative assessments employ a realistic context and purpose for assessing a student's general standing with respect to, to a key practice. These assessments sample rather lightly from the phases and from a subset of the related learning progressions. In contrast, the formative materials go much deeper. The scenario-based tasks scaffold students in relatively small steps through these phases and progressions. Whereas the discrete tasks target a specific learning progression within a phase, giving students practice intended to facilitate the transition between levels in that progression. The upper portion of this slide shows the model building and the application key practices that come into play around middle school and that extend up through post-secondary education. These are the key practices we've been focusing on to date. For each key practice, we've built one or more summative test forms shown on the lower portion of the slide and color-coded to the key practices above. For example, for the discuss and debate key practice, we've built three parallel test forms, which I'll say more about in a few moments. For the practices, we've also built formative and professional development materials of various types, including scenario-based tasks, discrete tasks, games, teacher handbooks, 
and demonstration videos to give teachers more familiarity with the aspects of the key practice. In both our summative assessments and scenario-based formative tasks, we try to model good teaching and learning practice, drawing upon principles taken from the learning sciences. One way in which we do that is by giving students something substantive and reasonably realistic with which to reason, read, write, or do mathematics or science. As an example, since 2007, Seaball English language arts assessments have been using a mini project structure in which students delve into an important topic before they write about it. This approach is in contrast to most US writing assessments, which ask students to compose rapidly in response to only a short prompt, a writing context that's virtually unique to standardized testing, and in that sense, both artificial and vacuous. In this Seaball Middle School example, the student must explore the topic of whether advertising directed at children ought to be banned by reading, analyzing, critiquing, and summarizing material from a variety of given sources, which may include text, audio, and video, all before writing an essay on that topic. A second way we model good practice is by including tools and representations similar to the ones that proficient performers tend to use. Proficient performers typically have internalized standards and criteria against which they evaluate their work as well as the work of others. Every Seaball English language arts assessment includes such standards and criteria for the particular literacy form that students are being asked to produce. Here's an example on the left of guidelines for summarizing an article. The guidelines communicate the elements of a good summary, which students must apply in evaluating faulty summaries we give them and in generating summaries we ask them to construct from given sources. These same guidelines appear in both formative and summative assessments. Our goal in repeatedly presenting these guidelines to students is to get them to internalize them, to make them a habit of mind. In addition, we hope that teachers will internalize them, incorporating them into their instructional routines. A third way we model good teaching and learning practice is to use lead-in and culminating tasks to suggest to the teacher how the skills required for more complex performance might be decomposed for instructional purposes. This summative writing assessment contains four tasks. The first presents a set of sources and asks the student to read and then summarize the arguments made in them. The second asks the student to analyze an argument in terms of the evidence provided for and against it. The third asks the student to critique an argument by evaluating the accuracy and logical sensibility of the evidence provided. The last asks the student to present his or her view in an argumentative essay, success in which presumes, among other things, being able to read sources, summarize their arguments, analyze them, and critique them. In addition to directing students to become engaged with the given sources and, and activating their prior knowledge, this structure helps identify for the teacher some of the critical skills that students are going to need to develop if they're to become proficient in the argumentation or discuss and debate ideas key practice. And of course, the formative tasks we provide include ones that target each of these competencies in much more depth. Last, as I noted, we use theoretically grounded and ideally empirically supported learning progressions. By learning progression, we mean a description of qualitative change in a student's level of sophistication for a key concept, process, strategy, practice, or habit of mind. That change may be due to a variety of factors, including instruction or maturation. 
We presume each progression to hold for most but not all students and to be subject to both empirical verification and theoretical challenge. As an example for the taking a position phase of argumentation, which I described earlier, the progression has five levels. At the preliminary level, the student can infer which side people are taking in an argument based on the reasons or evidence that they provide. At the basic or middle level, the student can distinguish an author's position from alternatives and identify critical points in need of support. And at the highest level, the student can explicitly evaluate the plausibility of a thesis in terms of the availability of effective arguments. Here's a set of questions aligned with that lowest or preliminary level, inferring which side people are taking based on the reasons or evidence that they provide. Students have to read each statement and deduce whether the statement gives a reason to ban or allow advertising to children. They then move that statement into the appropriate ban or allow column. The questions require thought because none of the statements offers a position explicitly. For example, the first says, commercials are usually easy to remember and hard to forget. So an advertisement can get a lot of people to buy something even if it's not good for them. A reason that would presumably be consistent with the banning of ads. We found that students who can't successfully complete this task are very unlikely to be able to write a convincing argumentative essay because they can't align positions with, or reasons with positions. Learning progressions then su suggest an ordering of topics for instruction that's meant to follow the sequence most students are believed to traverse in developing a particular competency. These progressions are intended to offer to teachers and to students a picture of how competency might develop that they wouldn't necessarily get from curriculum standards alone. Across the 11 key practices, we have over 40 learning progressions that define English language arts targets, instructional targets, from kindergarten through post-secondary level. These progressions are hypotheses based on an analysis of the theoretical and empirical research literature. They're mapped to the US Common Core state standards and they're publicly available at the URL shown there. So that's a bit of the theory behind CBOL. But how might that theory be operationalized in a school setting? Here's an implementation we've used that's associated with the teaching and assessment of an English language arts argumentation unit. We begin with teacher and administrator training, which is followed by a summative pretest. That test is intended to document where students stand globally with respect to the discuss and debate ideas aspects of the competency model and learning progressions. Next, teacher scoring of that test, along with discussion of student results in a community of practice, give teachers a starting point for formative follow-up and instruction. As part of instruction, teachers have access to formative discrete tasks, which can be differentially assigned to students based on pretest results. Those tasks can be used for practice at home or in class, and as individual work, as group work, or for whole class discussion. Discrete tasks are aligned with the argumentation, summarization, and thesis statement learning progressions, each of which is associated with a phase in the discuss and debate key practice. For instructional purposes, teachers also have access to a formative scenario-based task set. This set is a highly scaffolded, multi-session, argumentative writing mini project. Several of the tasks are similar to ones found on the summative post set test, while the others are scaffolding or elaboration. The set can be used by the teacher in whole or in part as he or she desires. A community of practice meeting occurs after completion of the discrete tasks and again after the mini project. The second of those meetings is followed by a summative post test which is a parallel form of the pretest intended to document progress. 
This sequence could take place over a significant time period, like a quarter, a semester, or even a school year, depending on the, the district's curriculum requirements and the purposes of its staff. Although this implementation might look regimented, it's actually a lot more open. What happens in between administrations of the two parallel forms is up to the discretion of the classroom teacher. For less experienced teachers, the formative materials are available to use as we suggest. More experienced teachers may choose to modify the materials or the ways in which we suggest they be used or bring in their own materials and approaches entirely. That aside, this implementation plan makes many presumptions, some of which we can test empirically. Two such presumptions relate to the meaning of the learning progressions on which the formative materials and summative assessments are based, and to the functioning of the parallel forms, which are intended to place students initially and to document learning subsequently. If the forms aren't empirically parallel, a distorted picture of progress will result. In order to test these presumptions, we created three item level parallel test forms focusing on argumentative skills for eighth grade students. Called ban ads, cash for grades, and social networking, named after the scenarios that they present. Each of the forms contained four tasks, with each task targeting a different skill or constellation of skills, and composed of questions using either a mix of selected and constructed response formats, or only one of those formats. Those forms were administered to students in 18 schools across six US states, producing a sample of about 1,800 kids. Each kid took two of the three parallel forms according to the design shown here. Each form was split into two 45-minute sessions, with both sessions taking place within a week and the two form administrations occurring within a month. With respect to parallelism, the research questions included whether the form means, standard deviations, and reliabilities were similar, whether the form intercorrelations approximated unity, and whether form produced unwanted dimensionality. Dimensionality associated with form is very likely to be due to differences in scenario, which would arguably be unfair, as such differences could advantage students more familiar with or more interested in a particular topic. For performance tests, there's considerable research documenting the presence of such topic effects. With respect to the functioning of the parallel forms, we can see that the means are close, with one form cash for grades being a little harder than the other two by about a sixth of a standard deviation unit. We can also see that the standard deviations are close and that the internal consistency reliabilities are very similar. Coefficient alpha is shown here calculated from items as well as from tasks which are locally dependent item groupings. As you can see, the differences between the two indices for a form suggest some inflation due to local dependency, but not very much. This slide shows the uncorrected intercorrelations among the forms below the diagonal and the corrected correlations above. As you can see, for two of the three form pairs, the corrected values are at or close to unity. On this slide are the relative fit indices for five IRT models, which we use to test dimensionality. The models are fit to task scores. The first three models are based on the two-parameter logistic model and the generalized partial credit model for the constructed response tasks. The last two rows show bi-factor models, which have a general factor as well as specific ones. Within each type, the models differ in the number of dimensions and in how those dimensions are defined. In particular, we compare models whose dimensions are based on task format, selected response versus constructed response, with models whose dimensions are based on form or scenario. A finding showing dimensionality based on forms would suggest a lack of parallelism, possibly due to differences in topic. Looking at the table, you can see that the AIC and BIC indices suggest different models, but in both cases, 
It's the model based on task format rather than scenario that appears to fit best. Because BIC imposes the greater penalty for the number of model parameters, the simple structure model might be preferred. In that model, the selected response and constructed response dimensions correlate at 0.87, suggesting that the dimensions measure different but highly overlapping competencies. Substantively, that model makes sense because the task formats are themselves generally associated with different competencies. That is, the selected response questions focus on recognition processes involving discrete skills, whereas the constructed response questions, like the essay and the summary, focus on generation processes involving the coordination of multiple skills. The second set of empirical results focuses on the recovery of learning progressions. Here, the research questions concern whether item difficulty relates to progression level in the expected way, whether progression level relates to time on task for the essay, whether progression level relates to grade placement, as we would predict, and whether individual students are placed consistently into levels by the parallel forms. If they're not placed consistently, there's no point in reporting such a placement. This slide shows the percentage correct on each form for each task related to a general argumentation learning progression associated with the forms. Note that there are only a few score points at the top and bottom levels, one and four, so those estimates may be imprecise. Even so, the task difficulty clearly increases with progression level. P plus goes down as level goes up. That's true for ban ads. It's true for cash for grades. And it's true for three of the four levels on social networking. Here we see response time on each form for the essay task, plotted by learning progression level estimated from total test performance. On the y-axis is response time, and progression level is on the x-axis of each graph, the graph for ban ads, the graph for cash for grades, and the one for social networking. The pattern is the same for each form, and it shows a steady increase in the amount of time devoted to the essay as progression level goes up. This increase is consistent with the expectation that students at higher learning progression levels invest more time in planning, in generation, and in editing. Shown on this slide are the percentages of students placed in different learning progression levels as a function of school grade. As students move up in grade, we would ex generally expect them to achieve higher levels in the progression. However, because we don't yet have longitudinal data, we do the next best thing, which is to look at performance cross-sectionally. Most schools in our sample provided data for only one grade. So comparing performance across grades runs the risk of confounding between school differences with between grade differences. The results shown here are from the only schools providing data for more than one grade. As would be predicted, the percentages of students placed at the middle to higher levels of the progression increase from grade seven to grade eight. You can see this increase particularly for levels two and three. Finally, this slide shows the consistency with which individuals are placed into the same learning progression level by parallel test forms. There are five levels. As you can see, individuals are assigned the same level 50% of the time and placed into the same or adjacent level 90% of the time. Given that these summative forms are only designed to broadly survey the progressions associated with the key practice, that's not too bad. The takeaway message is that if designed thoughtfully, a summative test might be able to offer a diagnostic result that's good enough to give teachers a starting point for formative follow-up, a set of formative hypotheses with which to guide instructional next steps and guide observation of student performance. Let me summarize the main points. First, Siebel uses a theory-based model for a system of K-12 assessment. 
That model includes a theory of action, domain theory in the English language arts, mathematics, and science, and learning sciences principles for exemplifying good teaching and learning practice to design summative assessment, formative assessment, and professional development that are intended to work together to promote achievement. Reaction to these ideas has so far been fairly positive as indexed by growing use of CBOL assessments and professional development materials. CBOL has been used by the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium, a group of states in the U.S. that contracted with us to uh, put some of our formative materials and professional development into their digital library, which then becomes available to all teachers in the participating states, by the World Bank, which contracted with us to translate some of the formative materials into Russian and then train Kyrgyz educators in their use, by Glass Lab, the Games Collaborative, which used some of the CBOL ELA learning progressions in the creation of one of its games, by the Singapore Examinations and Assessment Board, which contracted with us to train their developers in CBOL assessment, and by IMPAC, a program evaluation organization that contracted with us to use CBOL assessments to evaluate a reading intervention program. To date, our empirical results have also been fairly encouraging, and I showed only a small portion of what's been published is in press or is in preparation. Still, many, many questions remain, several of which we're actively investigating and others of which we have yet to address. With respect to the competency model, we continue to evaluate empirically the recovery of learning progressions, and we have many, many more learning progressions to evaluate. As to summative assessment, we're investigating whether our scenario-based assessment designs function as well as traditional designs, whether they produce scores that are valid, fair, reliable, and generalizable, and whether students are placed dependably into progression levels as a starting point for formative follow-up. With respect to formative assessment, we continue to explore how closely formative assessment should articulate with specific curricula. That is, should it be customized for each specific curriculum, essentially embedded within it, or generalized across curricula for a domain? We also continue to look at whether our formative assessment materials lead to consistent inferences and sensible instructional adjustments by teachers, and whether they produce the increased learning that we intend them to. In the area of professional support, the key question is how to develop training activities that can be both effective and delivered on a large scale. And finally, for implementation and impact, we continue to look at the extent to which teachers implement the CBOL assessments and materials in keeping with the theory of action and whether that implementation has the positive effects on teaching and learning practice that we intend. I'm sure you can think of more questions still. The number and complexity of questions derives, I think, from the fact that creating a system of assessment of, for, and as learning is a very challenging, maybe even impossible, goal. I prefer to think that the progress we and others have made offers hope that the goal of making assessment a more positive force in education and society is indeed within our reach. Thanks very much for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Randy, for such a brilliant presentation. There's a lot 